on YouTube and Facebook. The Alabaster Sarcophagus of Seti I The text of the Book of Gates, printed in the following pages, is taken from the Alabaster Sarcophagus of King Seti I, B.C. 1370, which is preserved in the Museum of Sir John Soane, at 13, Lincoln's in Fields. This sarcophagus is, undoubtedly, one of the chief authorities for the text of that remarkable book. But before any attempt is made to describe the arrangement of the scenes and the inscriptions which accompany them, it will be well to recall the principal facts connected with its discovery by Giovanni Battista Belzoni, who has fortunately placed them on record in his narrative of the operations and recent discoveries within the pyramids, temples, tombs, and excavations in Egypt and Nubia. London, 1820, p. 233 ff. In October 1815, Beltsoni began to excavate in the Biban al-Maluk, i.e., the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings, on the western bank of the Nile at Thebes, and in the bed of a watercourse he found a spot where the ground bore traces of having been moved. On the 19th of the month, his workmen made a way through the sand and fragments of stone, which had been piled up there, and entered the first corridor, or passage of a magnificent tomb which he soon discovered to have been made for one of the great kings of Egypt. A second corridor led him to a square chamber which, being thirty feet deep, formed a serious obstacle in the way of any unauthorized intruder, and served to catch any rainwater which might make its way down the corridors from the entrance. Beyond this chamber are two halls, and from the first of these Beltsoni passed through other corridors and rooms until he entered the vaulted chamber in which stood the sarcophagus. The sarcophagus chamber is situated at a distance of 320 feet from the entrance to the first corridor, and is 180 feet below the level of the ground. Beltsoni succeeded in bringing the sarcophagus from its chamber into the light of day without injury, and in due course, it arrived in England. The negotiations, which he opened with the trustees of the British Museum, to whom its purchase was first proposed, fell through, and he subsequently sold it to Sir John Soane, it is said for the sum of £2,000. An examination of the sarcophagus shows that both it and its cover were hollowed out of monolithic blocks of alabaster, and it is probable, as Mr. Sharp says, that these were quarried in the mountains near Alabastronopolis, i.e., the district which was known to the Egyptians by the name of Hetnub, and is situated near the ruins known in modern times by the name of Tel Alamarna. In the Yetnub quarries large numbers of inscriptions, written chiefly in the Hieratratic character, have been found, and from the interesting selection from these published by Messrs. Black Den and Fraser, we learn that several kings of the ancient and middle empires carried on works in them, no doubt to obtain alabaster for funeral purposes. The sarcophagus is 9 foot 4 inches long, 3 foot 8 inches wide, 
in the widest part, and 2 foot 8 inches high at the shoulders, and 2 foot 3 inches at the feet. The cover, and is 1 foot 3 inches high. The thickness of the alabaster varies from 21 to 4 inches. The skill of the mason who succeeded in hollowing the blocks without breaking, or even cracking them, is marvelous, and the remains of holes nearly one inch in diameter suggest that the drill was as useful to him as the chisel and mallet in hollowing out the blocks. When the sarcophagus and its cover were finally shaped and polished, they were handed over to an artisan who was skilled in cutting hieroglyphics and figures of the gods in stone, and both the insides and outsides were covered by him with inscriptions and vignettes and mythological scones which illustrated them. Both inscriptions and scenes were then filled in with a kind of paint made from some preparation of copper, and the vivid bluish-green color of this paint must have formed a striking contrast to the brilliant whiteness of the alabaster when fresh from the quarry. At present, large numbers of characters and figures are denuded of their color, and those in which it remains are much discolored by London, London fog and soot. The first to attempt to describe the contents of the texts and scenes on the sarcophagus of Seti I was the late Samuel Sharp, who, with the late Joseph Bonomi, published the alabaster sarcophagus of Oymenepha I, King of Egypt, London, 1864-42, the former was responsible for the letterpress, and the latter for the plates of scenes and texts. For some reason which it is not easy to understand, Mr. Sharp decided that the hieroglyphic characters, which formed the prenomen of the king for whom the sarcophagus was made were to be read Oymenepha, a result which he obtained by assigning the phonetic value of O to the hieroglyphic sign for Osiris. The prenomen is sometimes written to be read either Seti Menen Ta or Seti Menen Ta. Mr. Sharp did not realize that both the signs were to be read set, and he gave to the first the phonetic value of A, and to the second the value of O, he next identified Amenephtha, or Oymenephtha with the Amenephath of Maintho, and the Komephtha of Eratosthenes, saying, Hence arises the support to our reading his name, i.e., the kings, Oymenephtha. Passing over Mr. Sharp's further remarks, which assert that the sarcophagus was made in the year BC 1175, we must consider briefly the arrangement of the texts and scenes upon the insides and outsides of the sarcophagus and its covers. On the upper outside edge of the sarcophagus runs a single line of hieroglyphics, which contains speeches supposed to be made to the deceased by the four children of Horus. This line is in two sections each of which begins at the right-hand side of the head, and ends at the left-hand side of the foot. Below this line of hieroglyphics are five large scenes, each of which is divided into three registers, and these are enclosed between two dotted bands which are intended to represent the borders of the valley of the other world. On the inside of the sarcophagus are also five scenes, but there is no line of hieroglyphics running along the upper edge. On the bottom of the sarcophagus is a finely cut figure of the goddess Nut, and round, and about her are texts selected from the Theban recension of the Book of the Dead. On the inside of the cover is a figure of the goddess Nut, with arms outstretched. 
On the outside of the cover, in addition to the texts which record the names and titles of the deceased, are inscribed two large scenes, each of which is divided into three registers, like those inside and outside the sarcophagus. On the bottom of the sarcophagus is a large, full-length figure of the goddess, Nut, who is depicted in the form of a woman with her arms ready to embrace the body of the king. Her face and the lower parts of the body below the waist are in profile, but she has a front chest, front shoulders, and a front eye. Her feet are represented as if each was a right foot, and each only shows the great toe. One breast is only shown. The hair of the goddess is long and falls over her back and shoulders. It is held in position over her forehead by a bandlet. She wears a deep collar or necklace, and a closely fitting feather work tunic which extends from her breast to her ankles. The latter is supported by two shoulder straps, each of which is fastened with a buckle on the shoulder. She has anklets on her legs, and bracelets on her wrists, and armlets on her arms. The inscriptions which are cut above the head, and at both sides, and under the feet of the goddess contain addresses to the king by the great gods of the sky, and extracts from the Book of the Dead. On the outside of the cover, beneath the two scenes and texts which occupied the upper part of it, was a horizontal line of hieroglyphics, which contained two short speeches, the one by the goddess Nut, and the other by Thoth. The speech of Nut is a duplicate of the opening lines of that found on the bottom of the sarcophagus. The speech of Thoth is much mutilated, and can have contained little except the promise to be with the king and a repetition of the royal name and titles. On the inside of the cover were texts, many portions of which are identical, as we see from the fragments which remain, with the chapters from the Book of the Dead which are found on the bottom of the sarcophagus, and which have been transcribed. At each side of the figure of the winged goddess, which was cut on the breast was a figure of the god Thoth, who is seen holding a staff surmounted by the symbol of night. When the cover was complete there were probably four such figures upon it, and the texts which accompanied them were, no doubt, identical with those found in chapter 161 of the Book of the Dead.